Well, here we are for the 11th chapter of Aurelius Colors. This is a big one for me. When I started writing this chapter, uh, I had no idea where it was going. I had some sense of the direction that the story was taking, uh, but this situation for Aurelia caught me by surprise. It was not part of the outline, and I did not know how this chapter was going to turn out. As it turned out, it became one of my favorite moments in the story. Um, it's called Promontory, and I want to say another thing about that. Throughout this story, there are references to things that have been important in my life as a writer, as a reader, and um, references to people who have been uh, important influences on me. Uh, I didn't force them into the text. I just found opportunities where certain characters kind of reminded me of people or certain opportunities reminded me of turning points in my life. And so I called this chapter Promontory for a very specific reason. During the last couple of weeks of uh, my undergraduate years at Seattle Pacific University, I was working in a writing lab uh, as, a, as a writing tutor, basically. And uh, a woman who worked at Seattle Pacific University stopped by. She had heard that I was working on science fiction, and she invited me to participate in a science fiction and fantasy writers group. And that group lasted for several years. Um, I met people I'd never met before. Uh, they were all people of faith with big imaginations and writing very big stories. And so it was uh, a joy to find a new community right out of college, but it was also a joy to get excellent, thoughtful, uh, discerning, and sometimes very challenging criticism. And I learned to really love uh, that kind of context, that kind of creative circle that pushes you to become a better writer. I learned a lot from them. Then the group in later years um, took on a new vision. They created a nonprofit arts organization to encourage artists of all kinds in the Pacific Northwest. And the name of that nonprofit was Promontory. Uh, we saw that as kind of a symbol of a place that uh, breaks new ground, that gives you a place upon which to see a vast view of unexplored territories and new horizons. And so uh, that organization was uh, a very important learning experience for me as well. It was within those communities that the Aurelia stories grew. So when I named this chapter Promontory, it wasn't just because the word has a very direct literal application in this chapter. Uh, it was also uh, a nod of gratitude, a uh, gesture of thanks uh, to that community for how they made this book possible. So now to chapter 11 of Aurelius Colors, Promontory. A growl rumbled like a drum in the belly of the hound man while he paced in the wooden cage, sometimes stalking on all fours, sometimes striding upright. From her vantage point, high on the trunk of a tree that bowed out over the clearing, Aurelia watched him, fascinated. She had run for hours to catch the thieves, delirious with pain and outrage, but now that she had caught up to them, she found herself stunned by the spectacle. She had never seen a beast man in captivity. The rest of the scene was familiar. A family of Abascar merchants were hard at work bargaining with Bellamican traders, offering a mix of items they had purchased, stolen, or won at gambling as so often happened in a conference of dishonest bargainers, things were going sour. Aurelia surveyed the menagerie displayed on the merchant's table. She recognized this family from her travels around House Abascar. The children, Wynn and Cordy. The parents, Joss and Junie. But she did not recognize anything they offered to sell. She did not see her stolen bag or any sign of its precious cargo. The unfinished cloak she had run all night to recapture. These were 
probably stashed in the saddlebags on the merchant's vaughns, that is, if Joss and Junie were the guilty thieves. It had been a long night of pursuit through the wilderness, a throbbing headache of a night, and Aurelia began to wonder if she had made a wrong turn following rain-blurred tracks. She scratched at a ragged thumbnail and bit its jagged edge to keep herself awake while she watched the trader's faces. She hoped no one would bother to look up into the branches, for there was no concealing her cape, with the rose petals woven along its hem, which hung in the breeze like a flag. Get back, Wynne! Distracted from his presentation, Joss rose from the tree stump, his knees jostling the array of ornamental cutlery, arrowheads, and scissors on his rickety cellar's table. Wynne, his wide-eyed son, was caught in a cautious approach to the Bellamican Hunter's prize exhibit, the Snarling Beastman. That wicked dog might snap those bars and make a meal of you, boy. Shaking his head, Joss muttered, Children, they say you have them because you'll need them someday, but I swear by my mother's butter and cream that wind's curiosity will ruin us. Stop fretting. Abascar Man, the blonde-bearded Bellamican, who had introduced himself as Seder, took another noisy bite of his carrot, and then struck the cage bars with his polished walking stick. The cage is unbreakable. Catching beastmen, that's what we do. When we get to Bellamica, we'll earn a year's wage for this one. Hunters will outbid each other for the chance to turn him loose on an island and hunt him down for sport best game in the expanse. Junie jabbed her husband with an elbow. Joss, let's go. We've got more sense than to keep company with folk that smell of beast men. She and her daughter Cordy, a tiny thing with a mop of tousled yellow hair, were already stuffing their cargo bags with the stoneware, the glittering ore, and the sturdy leather shoes they had spread out on blankets for the Bellamicans to peruse. Reluctantly, Joss pushed his unsold wares off the table and into another bag, then yanked the wooden table legs from their sockets and bundled them together with a strap. He tucked the tabletop under his arm and lugged the pegs and the bags to the family's vaughn and fastened them with ropes and buckles. Young Wynne, his frame knobby like twigs and roots, his hair a sooty confusion, stood five paces from the cage, growling back at the beastmen, twirling a Vaughn whip absently, as if imagining a showdown with the monster. Cackling, an old woman seated on a pallet of cushions on the Bellamican's wagon rocked from side to side. She surprised Aurelia, who had not noticed her before. Wrapped in padded blankets like something breakable, only her face, carved in deep cut lines and her hands, fingers working at the air like spider legs arranging webs, revealed themselves to the cold mountain air. My boys got no problem serving up beast men for those who want to bleed them and those who want to watch. You speak of what's worth watching, woman, Joss laughed. How would you know anything about that? One more word about my mother's blindness and you'll join her in the darkness, growled Seder, now holding a hunter's throw arrow in each hand. Twas a beast man killed my boy's papa, the old woman shrieked. And their little sister too. Then it spat in my face and burnt out my eyes. She spewed a string of obscenities, so foul that little Cordy laughed and repeated the mysterious words quietly to herself. Then Eliroth chopped off its tail and Seder cut off its head. Wynne looked up at his father. Is that true, Pa? As if it understood, the beast man roared and pressed its face between the bars. This set both of the Abascar merchants' whip-scarred vaughns to scuffling in the muddy leaves and tugging nervously at their tree-bound tethers. Aurelia felt an urge to leap down, break the vaughns' tethers, and chase them loose to freedom, but first 
she'd have to check those saddlebags. No use squabbling, Joss Ker Harl. Junie bound up her goods and swung the heavy load over her shoulder. We'd best make haste. Rains are starting up again. Wind's been sneezing, and Cordy's lost her heavy cloak. Can't let him get soggy. Don't go just yet. We've got one more thing to show you. Sater slid the arrows back into the sleeves of his green fleece coat. Wait until you see this prize. You'll want to offer all you have, maybe even the Vaughns. Sater, shut it, hissed his older brother. They can't match the price we'll earn at home. Earn for what? their old mother whispered. What are you boys conspiring about? May as well show these poor Abascar folk the kind of colors we can wear in Bellamica. Sater walked to the wagon. Cordy uttered one of the old woman's foul words, practicing, giggling at the sound of it. Junie cuffed the girl in the back of the head. What is it, Sater? What are you rummaging for? The old woman rocked back and forth, legs imprisoned in her purple blanket wrap. What are you hiding from your mother? Sater, keep that bag closed. Elioth seized his brother's arms. Let's leave these wood folk. Thunder set the mountain shuddering. Rain tapped the branches around Aurelia and whispered on the fallen leaves below. Sater declared that nothing would vex the merchants more than a glimpse of Bellamican treasure. Conceding this point, Eliroth sulked, snatched stones from the path, and tossed them at the cage. The beast man swatted the stones aside as if they were flies. Juni, untether the Vaughns. Joss turned his back to the Bellamicans. I'm tired of their taunts, and I don't want Wynne growing accustomed to the sight of a beast man. Juni did not move. Sater dropped a bag to the mud, knelt behind it, and untied its leather binding. He drew a fold of cloth out and teased the air with it, wearing a gleeful grin. Aurelia sank her teeth into her thumb to stop herself from shouting. It was one of the stockings she had crafted for Lazika. She had not been attacked by Abascar merchants at all. Bellamican hunters had ventured as far as the gatherer huts. Eliroth and Sater had clubbed her and run off with her work. Brilliant, laughed Cordy, clapping her hands. It's brilliant. Her mother moved as if pulled by a powerful force, and Joss said, Junie, you stay put. Sater pushed the cloth back into the bag and unsheathed a curved blade from the side of his boot. Stop right there, Abascar woman, no closer, not unless you're going to pay. What are you selling, you blasted mistake of a son? shrieked the old woman who had rocked herself dangerously close to the edge of their wagon. Her eyes, wide and milky white, blinked one at a time. Show it again, said Junie. Show, Joss, what you just showed me. Sater reached back into the bag and withdrew a fold of cloth that opened to become a vivid span, its edges frayed and incomplete. You should see all we've collected. Aurelia felt a warm line of tears slide down her cheek. Ooh, Cordy ran to embrace her mother's right leg. Can I have those colors, Mum? Could we make them into a dress? As the sun cut through the clouds and tried to part them, the cloth came alive in the shifting shafts of light. The weave resembled a bed of multicolored polished stones glittering in shallow water. Your mum can't afford the likes of this, Joss whispered. Crouching over the luminous display, Sater whispered so his mother couldn't hear. You don't, perchance, have anything special, anything we'd enjoy 
to bargain with? Do you, woman? Joss would have stepped between them, but Juni was so quick to whip the hidden saber from the folds of her skirt that the Bellamican had barely finished his question before the tip of it pricked his throat. Sater seethed, head tipping backward slowly, sheathed his dagger, and then crawled backward on all fours, away from the blade. He took some Bellamican hero's name in vain and glanced back at his brother for support. It's like I said, Sater, snarled Elliroth. We're finished here. There's no more business to conduct. They're thieves. Mum, yelped Wynne, jarring them all into a silence like a falling plate before it hits the floor. The Abascar boy aimed an accusing finger at Sater. He was angry. These blasted Bellamicans are thieves. Those colors belong to Aurelia, and they stole them. Aurelia held her breath. Wynne remembered her. They've robbed who? snapped Joss. They've stolen what? Thieves, echoed Cordy excitedly. Brilliant. We've seen her, said Wynne. We've seen Aurelia with the gatherers. She wears colors just that wild. She's the one they stole it from. She's still a girl. Joss's black-bearded jaw wagged as he groped for a reprimand, but the boldness of his son's fury astonished him. Sater's throwing arrows were back in his hands, but he, too, was speechless. We don't rob children, laughed Elliroth. We don't bother with Abascar folk, and gatherers are the muck stuck to Abascar boots. Aurelia's not a gatherer, Wynne sneered. She just brings them stuff. She's from somewhere else. He had picked up a stone, and his intentions were clear. Aurelia realized this was going to end badly. She pushed herself to her knees, poised on the leaning tree like a bird prepared to dive. When Juni found her wits, she kept her saber aimed at Sader, but informed her furious son they would sell him to the Bellamicans if he didn't stop making things worse. Meanwhile, the old, blind, Bellamican woman was turning against her own sons. Take us out of here, Ellie Roth, she snapped. We don't need to listen to insults from Abascar brats. If that was my runt making stupid claims, I'd knock him down. It could happen. Ellie Roth twirled his walking stick at his side, finding a good grip. Ah, well, what do you expect? Sater spat at Wynne, living in the wild with parents dumb as his. Who do you think he takes after? Wynne lunged to dodge his father's grasp, drew back his arm to launch the stone. Wynne, don't! Aurelia jumped. Her feet hit the ground beside Sater's stolen treasure, and her cape settled around her shoulders, so she appeared to be a pile of leaves and roses. She raised her hands, stood and backed up, pushing Wynne away from the armed Bellamican. The merchants from both houses were open-mouthed and silent, and Wynne glanced up as if waiting for more people to fall from the sky. No doubt they were bewildered by what she wore, and by her condition, her bare arms and feet were caked with mud from her struggle up the mountainside. Fresh blood trickled again down her face from the wound inflicted by Sater's club. Her head pulsed with pain, and she blinked, trying to see through her right eye, which was nearly swollen shut. Relia! It was Cordy who moved first, toddling to embrace her. Give me the stone, Wynne. Aurelia held out her hand. If you throw it, these men will bloody up your family. The boy's arm fell to his side. Did they? He reached a trembling hand out as though to wipe the blood from her face. But then he looked down, seething, and shifted his attention to the tongue-tied Bellamican brothers. Give her back what you stole. Aurelia knelt down seized Sater's bag of loot and slung it over her shoulder, 
Seder clutched the cloth of the unfinished cloak and backed slowly away, delighted by this new turn of events. He teased her as if baiting an animal with a strip of meat. That twisted sneer had returned to Eliroth's face. The boy says you made this thing with your own hands. I say you stole it. Eliroth, did you take something from a defenseless girl? demanded the old woman. If I'm wrong, said Eliroth to the girl, please tell me if you do indeed weave things like this well. You're invited to join us on our journey back to House Bell Amica. You could craft whatever you like there. We would manage your work. Find buyers. For a percentage, of course, said Sater. Aurelia was still scowling at Wynn. Drop the stone, Wynn. Please. I'll be all right, and you will too, if you forget about them and walk away. Does it hurt what they did to you? Wynne said, voice quavering. Poor girl. Junie, speaking with more concern than she had shown for her own children all day, approached Aurelia to enfold her in a motherly embrace. Aurelia glanced at Cordy and saw wonder turn to jealousy. We'll clean you up good. You can travel with us and Weave anything you like. We'll protect you. Glaring back at Ellie Roth, she added, And we'll report these trespassers to the duty officers. Bell Amicans who beat Abascar orphans. I'm not an Abascar orphan, Aurelia muttered under her breath, and I don't use my colors to buy anything. Ellie Roth. I've a mind to turn this beast man loose so he can tear you apart. The bell Amican woman had begun to unwrap the cloth that encased her. What have you done to this Aurelia girl? And what is it you stole? Aurelia turned, pushed herself free from Junie's grasp. Please, she said quietly, staring at Sater's muddy boots. That cloth, it's not finished yet. She held out her hands. Please, if any strand is broken, any strand at all, it will lose its colors. Not finished? What do you mean? Sater lifted the piece of cloth, spread it over his head, and laughed in amazement as the sunlight, coursing through it, cast rays of changing color. There's more? Come and visit me. I have... Lots of other pieces. I'll make something for you. What's your price then? Joss glumly asked the Bellamicans, humiliated that he had been brought so low as to bargain with them. Avon? The whole lot we've got? You won't sell what you stole from me, said Aurelia, stepping closer, because Bellamicans aren't thieves. Are they? The old woman's brow furrowed over her sightless eyes. My sons don't take what isn't theirs. I taught them right. They must have just found it in the wood. But if it's yours, they'll give it back, won't you, Seder? Seder, you scum, hissed Eliroth. I told you to leave the bag closed. Seder blinked again. He lowered his hand. I am a bell amican, he said to Aurelia through clenched teeth, holding out the cloth to her, and he added in a whisper, Taking your bag was my brother's idea. Aurelia took the cloth, cradling it as something fragile and alive. We'll be back to see the rest of what you've made, Eliroth promised, a note of menace in his voice. You won't be harder to track than anything we've caught and strapped onto the wagon. But when you hear us coming, don't run. We might take you for a target and shoot you. I hope you bring your mother along. Aurelia draped the cloth over her shoulder, and then, as every fiber in her screamed, run, run, 
run. She glanced once more at the blind woman's deep lined face and the flesh of her arms as fragile as parchment. She has such beautiful skin. Aurelia walked toward the wagon. Instinctively, the old woman leaned forward, her large hands folding around Aurelia's. She caressed the girl's wrists and arms, gasping in surprise. You're, you're so young. You must be beautiful. She drew her softly forward and placed her hands on the girl's face. Fourteen, I guess? Fifteen. Aurelia shuddered when those rough, weathered fingers brushed the swelling on her head. The woman cried out, Who did this? And then she screamed at her sons with words that made Aurelia cower and pull away. But the woman's hand closed on Aurelia's shoulder to hold her fast. Oh, you're just the age my daughter was when... She forgot the rest of her words. Staring off into space, her hand tightened over the fold of glimmering cloth and drew back as if from something hot. Then she took the fabric and gathered it into her hands. Oh, the merchants and hunters watched as the woman gently explored the shining strands with her fingers. She choked and then clasped the cloth to her breast. It's beautiful. Either that woman's losing her mind or she's lying about her eyes, muttered Joss. I tell you, the old woman wept, pressing the cloth to her face. I, I can see this, just this, these colors in my hands. And then she let go, let the cloth fall back into Aurelia's arms. Take it, she whispered. It's yours. And thank you, thank you. What, what you've done. I could see it. I could see. Aurelia stepped away from the wagon, shaking her head. There's just threads. It's just cloth. I didn't mean to... Sater brought his fist to his mouth and bit his knuckles. Eliroth laughed and walked to the edge of the wagon. Mother, what did you see? Blue. Deep blue. Like streams of water, she smiled. And then gold, flashes of gold. The colors, they were flowing into and out of each other. Her face was pained with delight and yearning. Son, what is happening? I think I see your outline. I, I think I see light. Shadows, trees. Aurelia turned and ran, clutching the cloth. She took the path she had come by and left them all behind. When the fear that snapped at her heels drove Aurelia from the path, there was no longer any reason to run. She fought to break her momentum, but the slope was steep and she plunged downward through the barbed branches, gouging her legs, leaves of her fragile garment stripped away in pieces. She stumbled suddenly into open air and fought to keep her balance, staggering across a rocky jag that protruded from the mountainside. She reeled and stopped, the breath knocked from her lungs by the fierce light of the vast nothingness before her. For a moment, she thought she had stepped to the world's edge. Beacons of sunlight were falling through mist thick as cream. Standing on the stony promontory, Aurelia was immersed in clouds that surged above, all about, and below. A sea of shining vapor seeped through the trees and billowed into space, veiling evidence of the land spread out beneath. Her legs gave out, and she crumpled into a heap, shoulders shaking as she cried. Are you all right, Aurelia? Wynne and Cordy, following just moments behind, stepped carefully out onto the stone. They sat beside her in solemn silence, 
Wynne patted her lightly on the back. She laughed a little. I'm just scared. Scared of heights, asked Cordy. We're so high. We must be close to the moon. She peered over the edge. Look at the clouds, Wynne. She picked up a pebble and launched it into the, white, into the whiteness. I don't know what the colors are doing, Aurelia said to herself more than to Wynne. I don't know what they're for. I just make them. I just love them. But I know that what I've started, it isn't finished. Something's missing. Just keep making the colors. No one else can, said Wynne. But why? The blind woman. She, please, Aurelia felt the claws of fear again. Please, I don't want to think about that. Not now. Not yet. She tangled weeds around her hands and jerked their stubborn roots from cracks in the rock. I have to go. I have to clean out the caves. I can't stay at the lake anymore. There are people searching for me. Duty officers coming to seize me for the rights of the privilege. I can't go inside of Abascar Wynn. I can't bear those people. You could come with us, he said. Cordy was shocked. No, -uh, no way. There's not enough food. We'll buy more food if Aurelia helps us, Wynne replied in a measured tone Aurelia recognized as his father's. Mom and Pa, they could use the help. They're always saying they need somebody to watch over Cordy and me. Pouting, Cordy turned and grabbed a handful of sharp-edged gravel. She cast it out, a spray of dots expanding and vanishing in the mist. They wish... They'd never had us, she mumbled, and we don't have enough food. She fumbled with some of the old woman's curses and threw another stone. The clouds frothed, moving in thick so Aurelia could not even see the mountain behind her. Somewhere in the fog, Junie was shouting, her voice like the call of a sad, faraway bird. They're calling us to go back, Cordy whispered excitedly. Shh! Wynne put his arms around his sister and held her close. His young face, far too weary for one his age. Dark patches deep as bruises under his bloodshot eyes. Cordy smiled with the mischief of hiding. There who you belong to, Aurelia finally sighed. Wynne scowled. Why go back to them when they treat us like they do? They need you. They'll need you when they get old, when they realize they're not so strong as they think. Who do you belong to, Raelia? asked Cordy. She stared northward as if her gaze could penetrate the fog, reach to the mountains, and find an answer. I think you belong to Abascar, Cordy declared. I don't, Aurelia snapped. I'm leaving. They're just so, so blind. You mean like the, the old Bell Hammocken woman? Cordy asked. The question hung in the air for a moment, then was carried away on the rushing mist. Let's go, Cordy. If Pa finds us out here, you know what he'll do. Wynne took Cordy's hand and led her off the promontory and up the slope to the path, the fog washing them from Aurelia's vision. Cordy laughed. Look at me. I can't see a thing. I must be from Abascar. Alone in an ocean of gleaming pearl, Aurelia wanted to vanish within it. Far away, the beast man roared in its cage. At that moment, the clouds released their hold on the mountain, slipping away from the world like a falling sheet. When Aurelia opened her eyes, the expanse was revealed before her. She dug her fingers into the weeds on the edge of the rock to keep herself from falling. The whole world of colors, verdant fields, needled trees, the winding blue Thrones Call River, the vast lake, the darker Abascar woods, the distant gleam of the palace towers, the rising rugged stone lands of the east, the dark line 
of the forbidding wall to the north, burst into vivid life before her. It was so much, so much to take in. A winding line of birds unfurled from the trees at the base of the promontory, and she watched their serpentine progression. At first, they seemed to pursue the flying carpet of retreating clouds. But then, she saw a strange white bird with a gleaming red tail at the head of the line. They were chasing it, trying to drive it away. Like a shooting star, it dropped in a wild downward spiral, circled back toward the mountain below her, and vanished. And then, the red-tailed bird was there, alighting on the edge of the promontory before her. It offered a hushed and inquiring chirp. The bird's feathers were blindingly bright, reflecting something more than the sunlight. Tufts of blue feathers ruffled its collar. Its eyes were full of fierce intelligence. It cocked its head to one side, a small, round, black beak open and uttering that quiet word of question yet again. Slender talons gripped the rock, but it was the bird's tail feathers which burst, curling dark and wild in a gratuitous flourish that held her spellbound. Among those red feathers, a single shaft gleamed with a color deeper than red, a color she remembered but had never seen. Aurelia crawled slowly forward, breath fluttering, heart out of rhythm. The bird waited as if commanded to remain. Aurelia's fingers touched its tail cautiously. The feathers were hot, charged with the urgency of flight. The bird shuddered slightly as its one otherworldly feather surrendered to Aurelia's touch. Of course I remember you, she said, on the windowsill. My mother laughed a long, long time ago. She looked back toward Abascar's palace, that point of darkness in the woods, like the pin in the center of the spinning world. She held up the feather, and its color, vivid in contrast, seemed to bleed into the air, igniting the surrounding green, gold, red, and blue in a violent conflagration. For a moment, all colors coalesced into a living whole, as if she could reach out and take them by the edge, drawing them around her like a blanket. This is why I'm here, isn't it? She said, this is what my colors are trying to become. The missing piece. Choking back emotion, she held the feather out to the bird. Please, please take it back. If I take this, then I must... The bird closed its eyes sang a mournful note. The river of furious mountain birds catching up to their target turned day into night, sweeping downward, black and cruel across the promontory, buffeting Aurelia backward. There was a sound, a scream. It might have been Aurelia as she pressed herself against the stone to keep from being driven off the edge. It might have been the bird caught and carried away. The sound of wings and cries roared like a waterfall, and then they were gone. The tail feather lay burning but whole in her hand. The expanse lay before her. Abiscar waited, blind. <laughs>